saying. Praise the Lord in the highest. Peace to all people on earth. Glory the God in the highest. Wit celebrate Jesus' birth. Hallelujah, the King is born. Sing loud, the King is born. Celebrate. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Celebrate. Mm -mm. Well, that was a, a slightly different way to start from the uh, usual, but I thought it was just so lovely that uh, we were able to include that, and I'm thankful to Sam and Darrow for letting us do it. But most of all, I'm thankful to you, Madeline, for uh, singing so wonderfully and uh, reminding us uh, what we're missing. And we hope it's not that long before we're able to all be back in church together and singing praises to God together. Uh, it's so good that you're missing Sunday Club, and uh, I hope you'll continue to, to miss it, but only till we can get back there and be in the church again. Um, I think it's a, it's a great chance to also thank Elizabeth, who's been doing an amazing job uh, sending out Sunday Club material every week. And uh, I, hope that, I know the children are enjoying doing it and uh, the parents too. So thank you for continuing to, to go ahead with that teaching. And we do pray that it will be a blessing to all our children. And if there are other children out there who want to be part of it, let us know and we'll send you the Sunday Club material as well. So other than that, welcome everybody to our service today for Sunday the 26th of April. And uh, we're in our lockdown mode still, but we're thankful that we're able to be here doing it like this. And it's our prayer that it will be a blessing to all who are joining with us today, whether that's our own folk that would normally be with us on a Sunday, whether it's folk from elsewhere, maybe you're with us for the first time, special welcome to you if you are. Um, if you, hopefully you'll want to join us again in uh, future weeks as we seek to worship God together in this way. So I want us to begin by singing to God's praise. We're going to sing uh, a, a well-beloved hymn that we've sung many times. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. And it's a wonderful hymn about our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope we're obsessed with him the way that we spoke about last week. And I think as we dive into the theology of this hymn, it just reminds us who he is, what he's done, what he's still doing, what he will yet do for his people. And uh, we sing it to God's praise. We're singing along with a church in California, Sun Valley, California. And perhaps they sing it just slightly slower than we would ourselves, but uh, it's still a great opportunity to be able to sing along with God's people. Let's sing to God's praise together.
okay, it's good to sing God's praises. Now we'll turn to him in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise and bless you that you are such a wonderful God, that we have such a great high priest as the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, continues to minister to us and for us, even in his glory in heaven. We thank you for all that he has done. We thank you for his wonderful work on the cross that enables us to come in salvation and in thanksgiving and worshipping you today. And we do pray that as we continue to think about him, uh, we would be focused on him, that we would know what it is like John to be obsessed with him, remembering that he is the one who has done everything for us and who still helps us and who will always be with us. We praise you for such a saviour as Jesus. And we ask that you would be with us this morning. We pray you would bless us as we gather together. We ask that uh, you would be our teacher and our helper and our guide, and that in all that we do, we would seek to know you and seek to worship you and seek to serve you all the days of our life. Continue to watch over us now, to bless to us your word and take away every sin for everything that we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to God's word now and we're going to read in the first epistle of John, um, the same book we started looking at last week. So lest there's any ambiguity, this is not the gospel of John, the, John's biography of Jesus, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John at the beginning of the New Testament. This is John's letter to the churches. It's the fifth last book in the Bible. So if you need to find it, you'll get it in your contents page at the start. Uh, and it's the first letter of John. And uh, we'll read the, the whole of the first chapter. It's only 10 verses. We focused last week on the first four verses. And this week we're planning to focus on verses 5 to 10. So Kirsty's going to read that for us now. That which was from the beginning, which is Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Amen. Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, we'll turn now to, to look at God's word and they will go to that same passage. And what I really want to do is to focus on the verses 5 to 10. Um, last week it was 1 to 4 and this week it's 5 to 10. Um, so just by way of introduction, uh, let me read to you from a poem. It's not a Christian poem, it's a, a secular poem, but I, th I think most of you will know and recognise uh, these kind of words. I won't read the whole thing, just extracts from it, um, but I'm sure you know the words. Uh, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So th that was just a, a very short version, perhaps a quarter of the famous poem, If, by Rudyard Kipling. And of course, um, it brings in that kind of concept that when we use the word if, um, it has the potential to, to change things, that it's, it's if the, the son can do these things. 
if if he does this and if he does that, then in the end he will be a man. Um, but you know, if he doesn't do them, the implication is he won't be. Uh, so so the word if sets up a possible changed scenario, and uh, and it's it's that word if that I want us to to think about today, because the word if changes things, and perhaps sometimes we we even look at the Bible and we say, you know, what if. Pilate had found Jesus innocent and had refused to crucify him. What then? What if Judas had not agreed to betray Jesus? What if, taking it even further, what if Adam and Eve hadn't listened to the serpent? How then would the whole course of history be different? And it's that word, if, that changes things. Maybe we can even find ourselves saying it in this present situation. Um, if only the, the markets of Wuhan had been better managed, perhaps we wouldn't be in this situation just now. Um, if only we'd begun the self-isolation earlier, maybe we wouldn't have lost whoever. Um, maybe if we'd got an appointment earlier, maybe we'd been tested earlier. If, 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 if. And we can drive ourselves crazy thinking about some of these things. What if? What if things really had been different? And, and I mentioned the word if because the, there are five ifs in this little passage before us here. In fact, there's a sixth one just after it, at the beginning of chapter two, but perhaps we'll wait and we'll come to that next week if we're spared. Uh, and, and John brings in this word, if, five times. And as we mentioned last week, he's, he's doing it because he's wanting to combat false teaching, false ideas, false beliefs that are out there that are threatening to change the very nature of the Christian gospel and he knows that that can only ruin souls, that if people are affected, infected with wrong false teaching, it can only be to their spiritual detriment and perhaps even ultimately their spiritual loss. He wants to make sure that his readers know the true gospel and that they are genuinely saved and that they're not following a false gospel and a false teaching. Remember, he's obsessed with Jesus, and that means being obsessed with the word of Jesus and with the truth of Jesus, and he wants his readers to have that same obsession and to, to know Christ and to walk genuinely in his ways. And it's still the same today for him. we are his modern readers, as we are 2,000 years further on, but we live in a world that also is riddled with wacky ideas, false ideas, wrong ideas about God, about the Christian faith, about Christ, about the way of salvation. And we have all these voices in our, our ears saying, this is the truth, this is the truth, the Bible, that's not the truth, saying all these kinds of things. And what we want to just get back to is what John wants you to get back to. What does God say? What is the, the teaching of God on the subject? And it's what he writes to his readers about in this letter and in this passage we're focusing on today. So as we uh, begin to, to look at the passage, um, let's start with it from this point of view. Let's not start with that false teaching. Let's start where John starts because he doesn't start there. His starting point is God himself, not the false teaching, not the false teachers. It's God himself and that should be our starting point too and it is where I want us to start today, because we, we need to understand God himself. Obviously, we can't completely understand God, but what he's revealed of himself, what he wants us to know. We need to understand him and his ways before we can then see how that's different from uh, the error that other people say about him. So we want to be able to tell truth from error when it comes to the things of God. And John begins with this in verse 5. He says, this is the message we've heard from him, from Christ, and we proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay, so that's his great starting point. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it's worth saying at the very outset that this is probably John's favourite illustration uh, of explaining the world, explaining spiritual things, light and darkness. You go back to the Gospel of John, his, his biography of Jesus, you go back to that and read through it and you'll be amazed when you realise how often he refers to light and darkness and he, he splits these two things up. It's either light on the one side or it's darkness on the other. A 
and he uses this illustration over and over again. Uh, he obviously sees it and the Holy Spirit enables him to see it as such a good picture of the gospel. Uh, and what he's really saying, when he says God is light, what he means is God is sinless. God is pure. God is holy. God is anti-sin. God and sin are opposites, just in the way that light and darkness are opposites. You can't have the two things at the one time. If you're in a dark room and you turn on the light, then the room becomes light and the darkness disappears. Turn off the light and the light disappears and the darkness comes back, but the two can't be there at the same time. And John's using that illustration to say that where God is, there's no darkness. And where God is not, there is darkness. Light and dark can't exist together. And in this context, what he's wanting to say uh, is that uh, God represents what is morally right. And, and that's what the light represents. The darkness represents what is morally wrong. And only the Bible can teach us which of these things is which. What is right? What is wrong? What is God pleased with? What is God displeased with? That's, that's why we keep going to the Bible. That's why John wanted to teach his early readers. Um, he wanted to say, you've got to go to God's word. You want to know what's right? Go to God's word. You want to know what's wrong? Go to God's word. It's the only place you can find out what is right and wrong. There are people out there that will tell you this is right when actually it's wrong, or this is wrong when actually it's right. The only way you can learn is getting back to God's word. And we still need to learn that lesson. The only way we know what is right and what is acceptable to God is by going to the Bible, to God's word, and see what he has to say. And really the, the whole scripture, the whole of the Bible, it points us toward that, the things that God looks for from people, the things that he wants us to do, the things that he wants us not to do. Sometimes we find them in handy form, like lists, and uh, you can go very obviously to something like the Ten Commandments. And there God tells us very plainly some of the things we're to do, we're not to murder anybody or hate anybody, we're not to steal, we're not to kill, we're not to tell lies, we're not to be jealous of other people, yeah, we're to keep his day holy, we're to make sure that he comes first, we're not to misuse his name. All these things, it's such a, a handy list uh, just for starting off on. And th there are other parts of the scripture that are like that. Let me turn briefly for a moment to the likes of Galatians chapter 5. Um, where we, we get a list uh, like this. This is Paul writing to one of the Christian churches. He says, now, these are the things not to do, what he calls the works of the flesh. This is Galatians 5, verse 19. So these are the kind of things that God says are wrong and are to be avoided. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And then he contrasts them with the things that are pleasing to God, the, the, what he calls the fruit of the Spirit, things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that ought to characterise God's people, not the things in the previous list. Let me turn as well to uh, John's Gospel, John's story of Jesus. This is chapter three. This is the kind of place where, again, he talks about uh, light and darkness. And he says this, th this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, primarily through Jesus Christ. But people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. But everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so you see that there's John again using that same illustration of darkness and light. People who walk in darkness and who love the things that God tells us not to love, they're walking in darkness and they'll shy away and hide away from the things of God. People who want to please God and who love God, will look in the Bible and say, what kind of person does God want me to be? How can I walk in the light? Um, 
we think of the natural world for a second, we think of moths. Moths are drawn to the light. Lift up a big stone outside and there's creepy crawlies and bugs underneath. And when you lift the stone, what do they do? They, they scurry away to get away from the light. They scurry away into a wee hidey hole, um, trying to get away from the light. There's a sense in which you and I are either a moth or a bug, uh, a moth or a creepy crawly. Do we love the light? Are we drawn to the light of God's word? Or do we shy away from it and we don't want to know what God says? We don't want to stop doing the things that we like doing but God says are wrong. Am I a moth or a bug? Are you a moth or a bug? It's an intriguing question, isn't it? But the truth is, until we know, until we know and understand something of what God is for and God is against, then we can't understand anything else. We can't understand what he wants from us. Uh, we can't understand what John is talking about here. We can't understand what the Bible is saying. We can't understand what Jesus is teaching. We can't understand why Jesus came into the world, why Jesus had to die on the cross. Uh, we will never understand why we will yet appear before God in judgment and to be saved or condemned, acquitted or condemned whether we will spend an eternity forever in heaven or forever in hell. We will never understand any of these things till we know what it is the Bible is saying about God and about sin. And so much of the time we, we don't understand how pure and holy God is and we don't understand how bad sin is. And it's, it's needing to get that understanding that helps us to realise our need before God our need of Jesus, our need of his salvation, your need of his salvation. We, we need it because without it, we're lost and lost forever. Only he can help us to understand that God is holy and pure and unapproachable from us. He was very approachable in the Garden of Eden. He walked with Adam and Eve. They fellowshiped with him until they disobeyed him and fell into sin. They listened to the serpent. And then the whole world came crashing down at that point and sin began. And from that point, God became unapproachable. He became distant. And it's only in the coming of Jesus that that gap can be bridged again and that we can know God. And that's why it's so crucial to understand who we are, who God is, and what it is that has come between us. John will go on in chapter 4, twice in chapter 4, verses 8 and verse 16, to tell us God is love. He tells us here God is light. He'll later on tell us God is love. Many people want to start there. And for some people, that might as well be the only thing that's written in the Bible. God is love, so you don't need to tell me what to do. Uh, God loves me. God would never do anything bad to me. God would never cast me away. God will have me in heaven because he loves. And he does. But all that thinking is wrong. It starts with God is light. God is holy. God is pure. God is anti-sin. And as long as we are not walking in that way ourselves through Christ, then we will never know uh, what it means that God is love. Not everybody will be saved. Only those who have walked in the light, which is what this passage is speaking to us about. That's where John starts. That's where the Bible starts. That's where God starts. Sinlessness, holiness, purity. And it's when we know these things and we know the blessing of God, we will yet know the love of God and we will know that God is love for ourselves. And that can only happen through Jesus and what Jesus has done on the cross. And it's why you and I have to believe in him and trust him and follow him and know that our sins are taken away in him. And that's why John loves to speak about Jesus and about the truth of Jesus and the word of Jesus. And he wants there to be no false teaching that detracts from that. He loves to proclaim and declare the, the salvation, the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. And he loves to preach it. He loves to tell it. He's obsessed with Jesus, as we saw last week. And he wants others to be obsessed too. And in a moment, we'll come back in the second half of the service and we'll see what we need to know about ourselves and about God if we actually want to know God and we want to know that we're on his side and not against him. And John will explain some of these things to us 
um, in the next few minutes. But first of all, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing in Psalm 51. And uh, for those that know their Bibles, this was a psalm that was written by King David after he had sinned terribly. He sinned terribly. He killed and had another man killed in battle in order that he could marry his wife, um, who by this time was pregnant with David's child. So it was horrendous sin, one sin building on top of another. And when he finally came to his senses, when God convicted him of what he'd done and made him realise how wrong he'd been and what terrible sin he'd committed, he wrote this psalm of repentance and confession and saying, I'm so sorry, wash me, clean me, save me, change me. And that's what we're going to sing just now. This, many of us can echo that from our own experience. And um, we're singing along here with the, the congregation, the Free Church congregation in Dundee, St Peter's Dundee. Uh, they're singing uh, to the tune Ottawa. And uh, we'll sing that now. Oh my God, have mercy on me in your steadfast love, I pray. In your infinite compassion, my transgressions wipe away. Cleanse me from iniquity, sin. Wash my sin away from me. We'll sing again to God's praise.
Okay, so let's come back to this passage again and explore it just a little bit further. And for, for the sake of emphasis and clarity and understanding, I'm going to change the order that these five ifs are written in. Um, so that there's an if in there, six, seven, eight, nine and ten. Um, but I'm going to actually start with verse eight. Uh, so let me see. So it says here, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So some people say, and obviously said back at the time of John writing, that, yeah, I'm not a sinner, I, I, I don't sin. Yeah, excuse me, who do you think you're talking to here? Uh, I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm as good as the person next door, I'm no worse than anybody else, I've never done anything that's too bad compared to some. I've never murdered anybody or raped anybody or robbed anybody or knowingly hurt anybody. I like to help people, I like to give money during this time, I like to uh, support the NHS, yeah, whatever it is, everybody has a kind of sense of their own goodness and some people get really shirty when you say, well, actually you're a sinner, that's what the Bible says, and they say, whoa, no chance, I'm not. Um, but spiritually, spiritually, that attitude is described here as self-deception. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So John has been very clear here. It's self-deception to say, I'm not, a, I'm not a sinner. I do not sin. Every human being sins. And there's a reason why every human being sins, apart from Jesus himself. There's a reason why every human being sins. And that is because we are born in sin. That's something the Bible teaches us. We would never know that just from the natural world, does it? We know it because the Bible tells us that that is the truth. A few moments ago, we sang in Psalm 51, and you may have picked up the reference um, with, with David speaking about his own sin, but he says, actually, this is something that's been there ever since my life began, even as an embryo from the time I was conceived in my mother's womb. I was I was conceived in sin. The, the, the act of conception was not sin. That's God's method of procreating the world but from the moment that I began to exist I, I was a sinner and the seed was there right from that moment and would manifest itself as the years went by and we see that if we're honest even in the lives of our own children and ourselves when we, we look back because of what happened in the Garden of Eden because of Adam and his fall and his listening to the serpent the the whole perfect world that existed up to then came crashing down and has been flawed and broken ever since. Um, if if I say, or if a person says that they, they're born in Britain to British parents, then they are British. And the child is born British, like it or lump it. He, he or she is born British. It's just the way it is. So it is in the spiritual realm. If, you, if you're a human being born to human parents, then you are a sinner because they are sinful people you are born to them, you automatically become a sinful person. Um, you're a sinner from the word go. And that can be hard to accept for many people, except that the Bible tells us that's the way it is. And that is the truth. And it's only there that we learn the truth about ourselves. I'm not a sinner primarily because I sin. It's the other way around. I sin because I'm a sinner and I can't help it and nobody can help it. We're responsible, but we cannot not sin because we are sinful people. That's what we are by nature. We're born that way and it will stay that way unless God's grace changes us. There's an inevitability about it. The Bible will tell us elsewhere, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Or it will tell us elsewhere, like sheep, we've all gone astray. And it's true, and it's because of this sin that we're born in and, and cannot avoid. We, we sin, and it's because we are sinners. We, and, and we naturally incline away from 
the holiness, the purity, the perfection of God. We, we don't need to be taught it. Again, parents will know you, you didn't need to teach your kid how to tell lies. You didn't need to say, this is how you steal. This is how you cheat. This is how you hit somebody smaller than you and, and run away and pretend it wasn't you. We didn't have to teach them these things. The sin that is in them just comes out and we see it more and more clearly as, as we get older. And if we're honest with ourselves and we look in our own hearts, we can see that's true. We know that we're selfish. We know that we get jealous. We know we get angry. We know we get bad tempered. We know that we the people we, we can't stand it might even be people we hate. We know all these things. It's all there in, in the human heart. And the Bible's telling us here that if we pretend otherwise, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And John is anxious to make sure that the people he's writing to know you're not sinless, you're not perfect. You're going to need a saviour. But he'll come to that. Let me jump to the, the second if, which is in verse 10. Very similar in some ways. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. If we say that we don't sin, then not only are we deceiving ourselves, we're accusing God, God of lying, when he tells us that truth about ourselves. It might hurt your pride, it might hurt your self-esteem, and, and sometimes these are looked on as being like almost the worst thing you could do to somebody. You know, you've, you're dissing me. You, um, it might hurt your pride, it might hurt your self-esteem uh, to know that you're unable to get yourself to heaven, you're unable to be saved um, without the intervention of somebody else. But God says it's true. God says it's true. And we're calling God a liar if we disagree with what he says and until we see it by his grace until we we are enabled to see that truth by his grace then we, we don't understand and we can't understand why Jesus had to come into the world and why he had to die on the cross but when we see it that's the glorious point at which we can say Lord forgive me I am a sinner I need your salvation I need your help I need your grace I need you to take away my sins please Take away my sins, forgive me for the things I've done. It's when a person says that, that God is always willing to listen to that prayer and to, to save and forgive the person that prays that. Every, every single Christian in the world, and there are millions of them, and there have been millions, and if the world continues, there'll be millions more. Every single Christian who's ever lived has accepted that they are a sinner and that they need God's salvation. They need his grace to come into their heart and to change their situation. And they've asked God, save me, change me, wash me, forgive me. God has made that possible in Jesus Christ. And if we say we don't need it, we're calling God a liar. Let me come to the third if, which is in verse six. Um, if we say that we have fellowship with God whilst walking in darkness, then we're lying and we do not practice the truth. It's a lie to say, I love God, I'm a Christian, if in reality I'm not walking in the Christian way and in the way that God tells us he wants us to walk. It's a lie to say that, that I care about the things of God, that they matter to me and that I'm a a true believer in Jesus, if my lifestyle doesn't back it up, if my attitude doesn't back it up, if my behaviour doesn't back it up, if my words don't back it up. And that's why we feel so ashamed when we we do keep sinning, we let God down and then we have to say again, Lord, forgive me, I, I, I did something wrong uh, at that point. We'll never be perfect in this life. And the Bible's clear about that too. Until the day you die, we'll always fall into sin. But we don't have to be characterised by it if we know his salvation. It, it, a lot of it comes down to motive and a lot comes down to attitude. Do I want to please God? Do I want to walk with him? Do I want to walk in his ways and not in the ways of the world, not in the ways of darkness, not in the ways of evil? I want to, to walk in the, the ways of God. And it's about wanting to live as he pleases and as he 
direct. That, that's what walking in the light is. Not meaning that we're 100% flawless, because folk are always quick to point out, you call yourself a Christian and you did that. And it's shameful when it happens, but we have to say, I know, I know I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Lord, forgive me um, when these things become clear to us. So it, to say that we walk with God if we don't, well, that's, that's a, a terrible thing. And verse 7 picks up on that. That's a fourth, if, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this is the opposite, not walking in darkness, but walking in the light, um, wanting to do things God's way, wanting to, to, to do his will and to do what pleases him. We can't cling to the, the darkness, the things that we used to think were okay, the old things, the, the sin that we previously walked in. You can't do these things and still be a Christian. If, if a person, just, just to be ridiculous for a second, if a person is a burglar and they become a Christian, but they, they, they don't keep on burgling. They don't say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian burglar now. I'm going to burgle to the glory of God. You know, you can't say that. that that's sin, that's darkness. You have to leave that behind. I can't be a Christian gangster and go around shooting and killing people and you know intimidating people and blackmailing people and saying that I'm doing it. I'm doing it now as a Christian and I'm forgiven for it and so it's it's all right. You can't say that. It's nonsense. It just doesn't work that way. You can't. I don't know, if, if I was having an affair with a woman next door, I can't say, well, you know, God put us together and I love her and she loves me. Um, you know, it's wrong. And, and you have to turn your back on things like that. And it, it's having that consciousness that what is sin and what has to be turned away from um, if a person is, is in Jesus. There's, there's a story, I've, I've told it once or twice in church, but it's always worth telling again. Uh, one time there was um, the Bishop of Cologne in Germany. And as well as being a bishop in the church, he was also like a town councillor, some kind of low-level politician. Um, and he, he, he kind of, he was both things. And one day there was a, a lady in the town heard him swearing his head off and, and speaking the, the most awful kind of language. And she went to him and said, I'm shocked to hear a bishop talking that way. And his response was to say, ah, but when I'm doing that, I'm not doing it as a bishop, I'm doing it as a politician. It's, it's not the bishop that's swearing, it's the politician. And she quite rightly responded and said, well, tell me this, when the politician goes to hell, what's going to become of the bishop? The, the, there's no sitting on the fence, there's no middle ground. You're one thing or you're the other, you're darkness or you're light. You can't say, I'm a Christian, but I still do all the old things that I know God's not happy about. I'm, I'm wanting to walk now in a way that pleases God. Um, to say I walk in darkness but love the light is, is a nonsense. David Jackman says that, that that's like the person who's living down a coal mine and says, I want to get a suntan. You know, it, it doesn't work. You, know, you can't do that. If you love the light, you, you go into the light and you leave behind the darkness. That's the, the picture that's been painted for us here. And the funny thing is, well, maybe it's not, I shouldn't say it's a funny thing, but one of the things that we notice here, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we might expect it to say, then we'll have fellowship with God. But it doesn't say that. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's a strange thing, isn't it? That's a strange thing uh, to say, but... It, what it means is the person who says, I'm a Christian, but I can't stand other Christians. I don't like churches. I don't go to church. I don't need to go to church. It doesn't matter if I don't get on with these people. I, I'm, it's just me and God. That's what it's all about, my relationship with him. Well, that's not what the Bible says. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And it's so important that we learn to live with each other and that we're gracious to one another in this we see our own sins and we see the sins of our brothers and sisters. We learn to, to help each other and to encourage each other out of that. It's not about that solo maverick walk with God. And for those who, who do that, who walk with them and walk in the light and have turned their back in darkness, the blood of Jesus, his son, 
cleanses us from all sin. That's a, a tremendous verse that when we turn to God and we say we're sorry and we confess our sins, then our whole past is wiped out, we're cleansed, we're washed, we're forgiven in Jesus. It's not that God says, well, in that case, I'll just forget about everything you've ever done. or oh, dismiss it. Well, let's pretend it never happened. Let's sweep it under the carpet. It's not like that. What he's done is he's put that on Jesus. And that's what happened when Jesus was on the cross. He is dying for the sins of his people, taking the punishment that they were going to receive, taking it on himself so that we can go free. Our punishment is already paid for in him instead. There is no fence, there is no middle ground. We're either walking in the darkness or we're walking in the light. But we come lastly to the, the fifth if, and we find that in verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are to confess our sins. We're not to pretend to God that I haven't got any sins or that they're really not that bad. Tell him your sins. You don't need to tell me or any other minister. You don't need to tell a priest. Go straight to the Lord and tell him, Lord, my whole life has been sinful. I've done this, I've done that. We're not told we have to try and remember every single one of them or anything like that. But to, to recognise our sin, to, and you know, when, when we do blow a gasket with somebody, we should say, Lord, I'm sorry. When we do find, oh, I hate that guy for what he's done. Oops, sorry, I shouldn't be like that. It's, it's that kind of way, Lord, forgive me. And we confess our sins and we ask, please take that away. Please take that away, forgive me that sin. And in Jesus, we are forgiven if we trust him. We're told here that that's faithfulness and justice on his part. Uh, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And in some ways that seems contradictory because with God being holy, us being sinful, for him to be faithful and just ought to mean to punish us. But then since Jesus has already been punished, it's faithfulness and justice on his part to forgive us because he doesn't punish twice. And he cleanses us, it says here, from all unrighteousness, from all unrighteousness. No, it's not a wee tidy up. It's not a wee spring clean in my heart. Not a wee scrubbing up. The whole slate is wiped clean and it's wiped clean forever by the blood of Jesus. When he died on the cross, all my sins are taken away, even the ones I haven't yet committed. Martin Luther dreamed one night that Satan came to him and presented him with a list of all his sins and said, call yourself a Christian. Look at this, look at this, this is all the stuff you've done. And Luther, in his dream, he said he, he looked at the list and he had to say, you're right, that's true. But then he took his pen and he wrote across it, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses me from all sin. And, and that's it, it's not that we're denying that we did such things or we're like that, but it's knowing the joy, the peace, the forgiveness that comes when we know that the punishment we deserve for those sins is taken away by Jesus. John Wesley tells a story about, uh, he, he, in the 17th century, he travelled up and down the length of Britain, hundreds, thousands of miles, very rarely got into difficulties, though there were many problems that could have arisen. But one time he got, he got um, stopped by a highwayman who stole his wallet. And as the highwayman rode off, um, Wesley shouted after him, the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all sin. The highwayman didn't come back. Um, but that was a, he shouted that after him as he went. Many years afterwards, that man came to him. He was now a minister of the gospel. And he said, do you remember me? I'm the highwayman that robbed you of your wallet and you shouted after me. The blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all sin. He says, I couldn't stop thinking about these words. And in the end, I asked Christ to save me. And he did. And I'm here a trophy of grace and thank you for what you shouted after me that day. But it tells us something about the power of God's word. Even in that circumstance, the most unlikely circumstance for preaching the gospel. But the Holy Spirit took it and blessed it to the salvation, even of that highwayman. That's the gospel. That's Christianity. If you want to know more about it, you know, keep listening to sermons like this. Keep reading God's word. 
engage with us, um, whether that's one-to-one, -one, whether it's on the phone, whether it's by letter, whether it's by email, whether it's, uh, whether it's we, we can do the likes of Christianity Explored courses, question and answer sessions, chance to discuss, chance to interact. We can do that even virtually uh, in these days. We can find ways of making these things work. But this little passage here, verses 5 to 10, take it. I, I, I'm not saying memorise it. I'm not great at memorising things myself. But file away in your head that almost the whole gospel can be found in this little section from verse 5 to 10. You can go back to this again and again and remind yourself what's true. What, what does the Bible really teach? Ah, of course, that's what it teaches. This is the way of salvation. And it's all in there, just in that little section. Um, believers, keep, keep it handy in your head because over and over again, you'll come across folk who say, I'm not a sinner. And you say, well, let me take you to this uh, passage here in First John chapter 1. Uh, keep it in your mind as being a, almost like a perfect summary of what the Lord has to say on these important subjects. God is light. He's pure and he's holy, but we can know him in Jesus. And that's the, the wonder and the glory of the gospel. And when we do, we come to realise that God is also love. And we begin to know that love for ourselves as we know that he has loved us and forgiven us and washed us and saved us. And then we can discover why somebody like John is obsessed with that Jesus and why he loves him so much. And we can learn why we and you should be obsessed with that Jesus and love him so much because of what he's done for you and because of what he's done for me. May we all know that blessing, that salvation for ourselves. Amen. Let's just turn briefly to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonder and the glory of the gospel. Thank you that there is hope for sinners, uh, no matter what we've done, no matter how much we've done or how badly we've done, how far away we've been from you, no matter how long ago it was or how recently it was, there is hope. You tell us, come to me, confess to me, ask for my salvation. And you've promised that you'll never turn away anybody who comes with that prayer. And we thank you that rather you will forgive them because of what Jesus has already done and you will wash away our sins and you will not pretend that they didn't happen but Jesus Christ has already paid the penalty and the price and we pray that we would know what it is to be blessed by him and forgiven by him and washed and saved. May we all know that for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We'll just finish our service then with our, our final singing. And it's actually, it's going to be the same final singing we had last week. Um, when, I, when I prepared the video for last week, I, I'd forgotten that there was actually two versions of the same video. One had lyrics printed on it and the other didn't. And I put the wrong one um, up. And it meant that um, much as folk appreciated the song, they couldn't in any sense sing along with it. Um, so we've gone for the, the lyrics version uh, this week. It's um, yet not I, but through Christ in me, um, by City of Light down in uh, Sydney. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. Let's sing to God's praise.
Thanks again for being with us uh, this week. Um, we do hope and pray that you'll uh, join with us again next week and uh, we'll continue to explore God's word together and see what it what it says to us. Um, the notices will go up at the end of the service as usual. I think there's only one change and that, that's just about the ladies Bible study. It did start this on Tuesday past and it'll carry on this week. So all ladies that would like to be involved in a Zoom Bible study, um, do take note. It's Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Just get in touch with us to ask for details. I think all the other notices are unchanged from last week, but do just have a look and familiarise yourself with them. 
Let's just finish. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name. The earth is filled with your glory. O oh Lord our God, you are robed in majesty. You've set your glory above the heavens. We will magnify, we will magnify the Lord enthroned in Zion. We will magnify, we will Yeah.